بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لا حول ولا قوة الا باللہ العلی العظیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین و صلی اللہ علیہ وسیدنا محمد و آلہ الطیبین الطاہرین اللہم اخرجنی من ظلمات الفہم و اکرمنی بنور الفہم اللہم افتح علینا ابواب رحمتک و انشر علینا خزان علومک برحمتک یا ارحم الرحمن Alhamdulillah, we have tawfiq to continue our study of the book Ta'aleem wa Tarbiyat dar Islam or Training and Education in Islam by late Ayatollah Mutahari Actually, recently was the anniversary of martyrdom of Ayatollah Mutahari and we request Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his uh, best of salutations and rahma and mercy to him and all our godly scholars that have helped us in understanding the truth and remaining on the right track. In the previous session, which was the third lecture of this series, we talked about the significance of developing potentials and talents and we said tarbiya is a kind of development is not a kind of uh, you know industry that you add something from outside to the materials that you want to you know change today inshallah we want to uh, study the fourth lesson from the book which is about the habits this is very closely connected to the previous discussion the question is if tarbiyah if education is a matter of developing and training like a flower which has to grow then what's the role of habits in order to better appreciate the significance of this question Ayatollah Mutahari introduces to us two different attitudes one attitude is the classic, the traditional attitude. For example, many of our great scholars of akhlaq and tarbiya in Islam and similar to that in other religious traditions and even in some uh, philosophical traditions they have had this idea that ethics is a matter of developing some qualities in the soul, some virtues, and make sure that they become malaka. They become part of your character in the way that they cannot easily be changed because malake is a quality of the soul which is not temporary which is not changeable quickly they say kayfiyatun o hayatun راسختون للنفس تستر عنها الأفعال بسهولة من دون التربي. A kind of situation, a kind of quality, condition for the soul which is راسخة is well rooted, well established. bravery, generosity, 
are not available if once twice for few days uh, someone does brave things or generous things these are to be raw these two are to be well rooted well established and then if you have them actions which are suitable brave actions for example for bravery generous actions for generosity can happen easily you don't need to think a lot a brave person when finds out that this is a situation for exercising bravery would do it without pain without forcing himself without too much calculation and thinking the same with generous person so ulama of akhlaq have had this idea that we need to develop in ourselves these qualities and also good habits good habits are very important and they were also very much emphasizing on starting this as soon as possible when we are very young we can learn things and preserve them better you know very famous saying al-ilmu fassaqar kan naqsh fil hajar something that you learn as a child it can remain like a kind of print which is imprinted on a stone imagine if there is something inscript uh, inscripted on stone or you know printed on stone it remains if it is on soil on clay it can little by little be washed away or you know wind you know things otherwise you know they remain but uh, forces of nature like wind like water like people you know walking on it etc can wash them away but if it is on a stone no al-ilm of saqar if when you are a child you learn something and read and memorize it can remain inshallah but Ayatollah Muttari says it's not only for knowledge anything that you develop as a child it can remain not to the extent that it's impossible to forget or it's impossible to change afterward but it means that it would be very strong and not easy to lose them or to change them if they are good you don't want to lose them if they are bad it's very difficult to change them so this is why tarbiya in early years is very important and this is also why it's very important that children have very good memories in their early childhood because these memories these memories of receiving attention love kindness respect from family from friends remain in their mind and heart forever sometimes they are aware of it sometimes they may not be aware of it it's in their subconscious mind but still they have their impact so ulama of akhlaq had this idea that from early years we need to start tarbiya even from before birth even before delivery of the child but at least when the child starts understanding the environment hearing things seeing things smelling things then tarbiya must not be delayed uh, gently proportional to the level of their understanding their capacity but never we should forget tarbiya we should never abandon tarbiya actually the sooner the better if we help them in developing good habits and developing those good virtuous malakat 
then for rest of their life they have easy situation otherwise it would be very difficult to change later so Molavi or Rumi has this uh, story that I have mentioned in different lectures it's a nice analogy he says there was a person who had a bush outside his home which had thorns people who were passing it was not a you know big uh, for example lane very wide lane it used to be a narrow lane so people who were passing by the thorns of this bush annoyed them hurt them injured them they were complaining to this man why you don't remove this and he was just delaying he was delaying and then years passed finally this bush became you know so giant huge and was impossible for people you know to p cross to pass and he decided to remove it but he was no longer that young a strong man bush was getting a stronger and a stronger and he was getting weaker and weaker so he says kharbun dar قوتو برخواستن خارکن در سستی و در کاستن very beautiful خار means thorn خار بون means the roots of this bush with thorns در قوتو برخواستن was becoming stronger and rising becoming taller Kharkan, Kan from Kandan, the one who wanted to remove and uproot this bush with thorns, opposite to the bush which was going higher and becoming stronger, that Susti was becoming weaker and was reduced in the power. what is the point the point is that if you don't fix your problems if you don't fix issues that are there in your mind in your heart bad habits bad akhlaq when you are young then fighting them later combating them later removing them later becomes more difficult you become weaker and they become stronger so it's better not to delay as soon as possible try to go for treatment <laughs> like in a medical disease also mm, uh, and treatment the sooner the better Saadi also this was by Molavi Saadi also says Harke dar khurdish ادب نکنند در بزرگی ادب از او برخاست whoever is not educated when he or she is very young خورد سال infant if تربیه is not offered when someone is very young when that person becomes an adult and middle age تربیه is not going to work and that person would not have proper adab politeness and courtesy chub tarra chenan ke khahi peach nashavad khushk juz be atash rast the second part has become a proverb in farsi when there is a tree and you take for example a branch and it's still wet young fresh you can twist it even you can give it a shape and if it dries remains with that shape but 
a dried piece of wood a dried branch for example of a tree whatever take whatever uh, form it has taken it will remain and if you want to change it it can break it if you want to make sure that you can change it and not break it you have to heat it those who make you know chairs desks from bamboo etc one of the things they do is they heat so nashavad khushk juz be atash rast something which is dry only fire can make it straight if it is burning this also refers to punishment of fire that if we have uh, lost a straight path and have developed bad habits and bad mm, I don't know, mm, traits of character only punishment can again make us straight so Tarbiya should be done as quick as possible or at least should start as soon as possible because we need it all the way in Farsi they say ba shir andarun shod va ba jan bedar rafat if something is given with milk means when mother fosters the baby if something at that time is given to the child like love for Allah love for Ahlul Bayt kindness adab etc something which is given with milk at the time of fostering a baby only would leave when this person is dying when the soul is going leaving the body okay then the soul takes all this with itself or herself so according to them according to our uh, scholars tarbiya is a matter of developing and training but at the same time helping in acquiring positive virtuous qualities and habits some modern educationists they are against habits even positive habits good habits for example he refers to John Jacques Rousseau these people have the idea that the main element in tarbiya must be free will a child a teenager a young person an adult a middle age they should act according to their own free will and aql intellect nothing should weaken the scope of free will if something becomes a habit then it reduces the free will so they are not happy with that as we said before in the discussion about insan kamil you remember in one discussion i mentioned at the beginning this point that any philosophy any thinker any religion any school of thought may have some uh, strong points you cannot find anyone or any school that has 100% missed the truth actually if something was 100% against the truth was good because then by doing the opposite we could <laughs> understand the truth 
always falsehood <laughs> decorates itself with some truth and always people find some truth and miss parts of the truth it's a matter of how much so even Marxists they have some good points but when they exaggerate when they deny other aspects that's the problem capitalists I don't know any school they have something nice but the problem is not to see the rest of the truth or to magnify their piece of truth to exaggerate etc so these people have some positive observation but they have missed also part of the picture what we accept and actually is mentioned in our hadith is that we should not do things habitually in the sense that we lose our awareness we do them just automatically like a robot no this is not good for example we have this hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam la tanzuru ila kathrati salawatihim aw salatihim salawat is plural for salat wa sawmihim wa kathrati al hajj wa al ma'roof wa tantanatihim bil layl some people pray a lot fast months of Ramadan then throughout the year they fast a lot they go for Hajj many times they do many good things many charitable work etc they do Salatul Layl but Rasulullah says don't look at these things alone but look at Sidq al hadith wa ada al aman how much they tell the truth how truthful they are how much they deliver the trust back to the people who have entrusted them with this thing how much they are trustworthy then Imam Sadiq has a hadith which explains this. He says, La tanzuru ila tule ruku al rajule wa sujude. Don't look at long ruku, long sajde that someone may have. Say, oh, he must be very good because his sajde is long. His ruku is long. Certainly to have long ruku, long sajde is very good. But just having them as actions would not show that this person is a great person necessarily why because this is something that he's used to he's accustomed to if he stops he feels very bad so he does it just out of habit in order not to feel bad ولكن انظروا الى صدق الحديث واداء امانته صدق حديثه واداء امانته look how truthful he is in his words how much he is trustworthy what does it mean it means that even great actions like salat like siyam like salat al layl like charity work as long as we do them with intention and attention they are great but the moment they become just habits we do them without being aware of what we do they become just a set of routines that we do it automatically like a robot then they don't help us that much still they're better than not doing but they're not helping us deeply therefore a person who does all these things when is faced with a situation that he can tell the truth 
and face some challenge or tell a lie and easily get what he wants those habits may not help him to be truthful if salat is done with intention and attention you cannot tell lie you cannot uh, not give you know trust of people back to them you cannot betray you cannot be selfish you cannot be aggressive to people and ignore their rights but salat as a habit yes it can be there and people can do mischief again khawarij are very famous examples of people who used to do lots of salat on their forehead they were strong effects of sajda but did this salat help them no actually maybe because of this salat they were proud of themselves they became arrogant so this point is very valid point that we should not do things just out of habit Ayatollah Muttahir says for example some people when they are told that because you are ill you must not fast they say no I have to fast I have always been fasting from childhood I've been fasting I have to fast Baba, you are fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the same Allah who told you to fast says not to fast why you say I must fast <laughs> this shows that it has become a habit and he enjoys more when he acts according to his habit of course there can be other explanations but this is maybe one common possibility well, well, you know one of ulama used to say that if someone has been imam of jama'ah in a masjid And for, I don't know, years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, he has always been attending Jama'ah on time, N never missed any Jama'ah. Is this a good thing? Some people say, oh, mashallah, so much of dedication. For tens of years, this Imam of Jama'ah never missed one salat al jamaah but one of ulama was saying that actually this is very worrying why because in all these years he never had something more important some emergencies for example no one was in need of being taken to hospital there was no issue at home no issue with the neighbors family anything in all these years that could have be urgent and be prioritized over salatul jama'ah which is mustahab it's very unlikely to think that it's not impossible it's very unlikely that for years never something more important happened so this island was saying that we have to be very careful we should never be too much attached even to good things because if they become like habits or if we think they are you know wajib all the time then we may miss some other thing which might be more expected from us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time you want to go to Salatul Jama'ah that's great but then it's raining you see a lady carrying child is on the street waiting for someone to give lift you have the choice you can go for Salatul Jama'ah you can help this lady which one is more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
of course conditions are different sometimes if you don't give lift there is a taxi behind you know taking this lady there are lots of factors but I'm saying we should always be open to find out what Allah expects from me at this moment don't seek Allah's pleasure always where you expect many times Allah's pleasure can be where we don't expect and Allah wants to see how alert we are you know I always say we should look around 360 degrees so that we don't miss any opportunity like Musa salam. if Musa salam was just looking to the road in front of him he was not seeing the fire on the side of the road and would have missed the great opportunity of receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you have to look around and see what Allah wants from me don't say no I just want this sawab I just want this action anyway these are beautiful valid points that we have to be open we have to be uh, vibrant at the same time that we don't lose our lines of practice our regularities but we are not doing things rob as a robot the beauty of telling truth and adaul amana is that because they are with different people with different issues different risks etc they never become robotic action but because Salat has very fixed a structure and you know Salat is is this much what you have to do Salat is low Salat as therefore they can become robotic actions if you are not careful by the way even for Salat it's good if you can use things that would not let a uh, you know particular thing take shape in you for example for qunut for sajda the last sajda use different du'as different dhiks apart from wajib ones for mustahabat so that there is something ch changeable so that it doesn't become robotic but what is not valid in the idea of those people who oppose habits so the one aspect was good we have it ourselves but what is not valid is to oppose all kinds of habits and say they are bad or they are uh, stopping our free will our actions would lose its moral significance because we do it them automatically etc no Ayatollah Mutahari here introduces a distinction between what he calls Adat Fi'li wa Adat Infi'ali. Ada in Arabic or Adat in Farsi means habit. Adat is plural. Fi'li and Infi'ali. Fi'l means action, is active. Infi'ali is passive is reactionary Adat fi'li are very good for example writing whether you write with pen or pencil whatever writing needs to develop habits if you don't develop habits and you want to do things like drawing picture <laughs> every time you know how much time it takes we cannot write anything we develop habits for writing or driving many things that we do during the day in our job in our personal life cooking washing driving swimming riding bicycle even walking do, do you think you can walk without using habits that you have developed as a child 
And if someone doesn't develop good habits at that time, may always walk <laughs> in a way which is <laughs> not balanced, for example. Riding bicycle is not possible without developing some habits. These are good habits, fi'li. These are active, actual habits and they help us a lot. What is bad is infa'ali, reactionary. For example, I have to always sleep on this kind of mattress, on this kind of pillow I should put my head. Only this drink I can eat, with, you know, drink with my food, or this type of rice, with this type of cooking, with this type of spice, otherwise I cannot, you know, finish my day. These are things that are negative because they bring weakness, they bring reliance, dependence, they restrict your choices, they make life for you and other people difficult. Sometimes it's good to have organized life, but not like, you know, <laughs> iron. For example, it's good that every day you have breakfast at this time, lunch at this time. It is good. But you shouldn't be disturbed if something important happens and you have to change it. So, you know, because I couldn't have my breakfast at 7 o'clock, this day is damaged. This is not good. So, if you develop a habit for Salatul Layl, is it good or bad? Those who oppose all the habits, they say it's bad. You shouldn't develop ha uh, habits and every day try to do Salatul Layl. But we say, to develop habit of doing Salatul Layl is not stopping your free will. It's like developing habits of riding bicycle, riding, swimming, driving. It makes it just doable. Otherwise, every, if you don't have a habit of Salatul Layl, every day you have to struggle to get up and then leave your you know bed make wuzu and say salatul layl but if you have developed habit still you have free will it's not that you must do salatul layl you may have habit you can easily wake up but for example you have now to take someone to hospital okay you take him to hospital or for example i don't know something urgent has come you have to leave the home earlier you can do it it's not that you are forced to do Salatul Layl or you would do Salatul Layl without understanding. No, it's a habit which is positive, which is making me more capable of using my options and exercising actually my free will. If I am not used to it, laziness creates a kind of resistance in me. And I, I know I have to wake up, but before going to bed, I decide to wake up. When I'm in the bed, I cannot wake up. So this is the discussion about habits. And inshallah, we continue this discussion uh, in the next session, inshallah. Uh, towards end of this lesson, uh, Ayatollah Mutahari starts the preparation for the next topic which is about what makes an action moral, what makes an action morally significant, or what gives moral status to an action. Uh, inshallah, we will continue this discussion in the next session. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. May Allah bless you, inshallah. asking question, can please mention your city? Yeah, no,
السلام عليكم عليكم السلام ورحمه الله Thank you, Maulana, so much for your enlightening lectures. They are yeah, really, well. very, very helpful. Thank you so much. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Alf khair. Maulana, my question is that uh, habits, as you said, they are good or bad. And I would like to know more about malaka. When you have the malaka of a ha- over a habit, it's a conscious and very, you have to be very aware while we are having malaka. It's a power and control. Could you just talk, tell me more about it? And it can also be good or bad? Yeah. Malak is a quality which is well shaped and formed and rooted. It can be positive malakat, it can be negative, it can be virtuous or vicious. For example, bravery, generosity, kindness, patience, gratitude. These all can become malakat. You have developed what we call a second nature of being grateful, being polite, being patient, being organized. If they are malakat means they are well established and you don't need to struggle every day to do these actions which are suitable. They match that malak. But malaki can be also negative. For example, someone is impatient, someone is miserly, someone is selfish, someone is fearful. So therefore, akhlaq is to help us with bringing good actions and avoiding bad actions, and also developing positive malakwat virtues, and avoiding removing negative malakat or vices if these malakat are developed positive ones virtuous ones they make life very easy for us and also we will be resurrected with these malakat the most important thing when we are resurrected is our aqaid and malakat then actions Malakat, generally speaking, are more important than actions. If someone has some generous acts, he will be rewarded. But your generosity is always with you. And some believe that if someone has even one virtue, but in a strong way, they will not be punished by fire. So if you are really truly generous, like Hatamatai, you will not be put in fire. Maybe this person will not go to heaven, but will not be punished. Because these virtues are all godly qualities. And if we manage to develop these virtues, then they will save us in dunya, they will save us in the hereafter. I'm not saying one virtue is enough, but I'm saying that even one virtue, if it is developed fully, can save us. And in reality, these virtues are very much interwoven. You cannot be very generous person and then not patient. You cannot be very generous person and then, for example, Um, a person who disregards the rights of other people. Uh, Many of these virtues, if they are really developed, they lead to other virtues. So, Maulana, my question is like, Malika is a virtue and it's different from habit because this is done consciously with a, a lot of awareness and also you have to control it all the time. You can lose it one can lose it very easily as well. Is that correct? So, Malaka is about virtues or vices. Habits are more actions, but when these actions become habits, they resemble Malakat because they have become fixed. But habit can be action. For example, habit of waking up 
at certain time. This is a habit. It's not, we don't call this malake. But it's very similar to malakat. So in akhlaq, we should develop virtuous malakat and useful habits, but never let anything eliminate our consciousness, our intention and attention. Do things with intention and attention. For example, I do tasbih of Lady Fatima. It should not become something that I do it without attention. Just Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, without attention. And still it's useful, I'm not saying it's useless, but when it is with attention, it works in a different way. Every Allahu Akbar that I say, I should say it and mean it and let it go in my heart. Allah May Allah bless you. Thanks for another, another one small question is like for uh, salah, that Subah. If a person has a habit of sleeping late and he knows that when he wake up for morning prayers and yani he can only pray the morning prayers very attentively. So if he prays Salah uh, Nawafid Subah before sleeping and then uh, like 11, 12, 1 and then wakes up and prays only Wajib, fad, fad, only Fad the Subah, is it okay? You mean Salatul Layl or Nafil Layl? No, not sal Salatul Layl also if you sleep, before sleeping he prays Salatul Layl and then after that he prays the Mawafil Subah. And then he goes back to sleep like 11, 12, 1, 2 and then he wakes up for the Fajr and so he's fresh, little fresh and he can easily and nicely pray Fajr with a lot of attention. But if he has to pray the Nawafil also then he feels a bit tired. It's not a problem. Not problem. First you feel tired, but little by little you get used to it. For, for young people, it is possible to do Salatul Layl before they sleep, if it is before midnight. After midnight, everyone can do Salatul Layl. Midnight for Salatul Layl, okay? Uh, because mid midnight for Salat al Maghreb is different from midnight for Salatul Layl. So, after midnight, Everyone can do Salatul Layl. Young people can do it whenever they go to sleep in the night, even if it is before midnight. But people who are not young, then if they miss Salatul Layl, they should do Qadha. So after they wake up after Fajr, they do Qadha of Salatul Layl. Okay. And Nawafil is fine if he sleeps before sleeping when praise Nawafil. Again, if, if Nawafil is before its time, for example, Nawafil of Fajr is after Fajr. You cannot do it before Fajr. But you can do Qadha if you miss it afterwards. You cannot do earlier, but you can do Qadha. Only there are some flexibility with Salatul Layl. And also, if you do Salatul Layl, if you rack up before Fajr, you know, some details about Salatul Layl, Salatul Fajr, you check the Risala of your Marja. But for example, I cannot do Salatul, uh, sorry, Nafilatul Fajr at Maghrib. I cannot do Nafilatul Zohr in the morning. Everything has a fixed time. You cannot do it before. And if you miss it, you do Qadha. Thank you so May Allah bless you, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Allah, there is a question in the chat. Uh, Fajr Mustahab cannot be done before Fajr time. I think is it a question or... Yeah, so cannot be done before Fajr. For example, now is 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m. You say, I want to do Nafilatul Fajr. You cannot do Nafilatul Fajr so early. Only they may allow, you check your marja, if you have done Salatul Layl and still there is time till Fajr, maybe they allow Salatul Fajr before Fajr after certain raka of Salatul Layl. Just check. But 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m., just you want to do Nafilatul Fajr? No. 
or during the previous day, you want to do Nafilatul Fajr? No. Nafilatul Fajr is after Fajr, before Salatul Fajr. This is the main time. Exception might be there, as I mentioned, but not too early. Alaikum wa rahmatullah wa rahmatullah. You say free will is important. Of uh, course. We, we as, as parents uh, uh, try to control our child uh, to study the subjects or many things. Uh, but uh, this age uh, is not support this behavior of parents. Uh, people, uh, the ch child um, uh, rebellious, being rebellious about this, this behavior. Uh, uh, I, I have witnessed uh, uh, recently in my family, the child leave home because he just didn't want to study. Um, uh, what is the uh, main reason uh, is the reason only controlling behavior of parents or the lots of exposure by internet or please comment on this. yeah there can be different things uh, for different factors nowadays unfortunately uh, or sometimes fortunately <laughs> it depends on the situation uh, parents are not the only people who have control over tarbi of their children. It can be good, but most of the time it can be bad. If parents are not able to do their job properly, so it's good that some help is available from outside. But the problem is that many times these external factors force themselves into the life of the child. And even parents either are not aware or they cannot sometimes do anything or if they want to do something then the child thinks that he is pressurized or she is pressurized etc. It's a very uh, you know challenging time. So what we need to do is we need to start tarbia as early as possible when you have uh, more time with your children they are more attentive to you. a time comes that the child wants to just imitate parents when you are saying salat even you without you saying you should say salat the child wants to imitate you in salat wants to imitate you in everything you do you must use that time and make sure that they are well tuned into the value system that you have uh, found to be working for you for humanity it's not that you know we just have some superstitious ideas they want to pass on to the children no the things that are based of our you know studies based of knowledge based of ma'rifa we have received from our godly scholars we have them working for us. We want to make sure our children are not deprived of those things. So we have to start as early as possible, but gently, patiently, and continuously. Not aggressively, harshly, with on and off. Few months put lots of pressure, a few months leave it. No. Continuously, but gently. And be steadfast when the child becomes eight nine ten you must have almost finished the job and just make sure that it continues but if at eight nine ten we want to start it's difficult because now they spend lots of time in the school with others system you know uh, different societies have different educational values it becomes too late although we should not uh, be hopeless and despaired but we have to make sure that by eight nine they have already got most of the things and just they have to maintain and nutrish 
we mostly witness in our society fathers uh, 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 didn't try to talk with son in teens we witness they have lots of distance between both yeah so this is a very important point sometimes this happens and sometimes it's not because they don't want it but maybe they don't know how to do it or they want the children to go b to them because they don't want to impose themselves mothers can have great role here so mothers who are wise they try to make the relation between father and children better don't try to replace father try to make relation of father and children better say positive things about father to the children say positive things about children to the father try to make the relation better don't think that you can alone do everything or don't think that you have to do the job of father they don't need father no try to be a good link and be a good manager as a mother you do you, you do your own part but also try to improve the relation between children and their father. It's very important. But, un but unfortunate, unfortunately, the uh, parents both are blaming each other. Ah, that's not has, that's not, not helpful. Even if you are sure that your husband or your wife is not doing their job properly, don't fight over this. Don't quarrel. Just, do you see anything positive they do? Even once in a while, highlight that. Mashallah, you did this. I am very happy, very grateful. Thank you very much. I don't know what I can do without you. Say these things and try to encourage that person. It is so much difficult for mother. Yeah. Because mother wants to um, relieve their child um, instantly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but father, father, try to uh, understand child and explain him. Uh, but uh, mod sometimes mother create hurdle. Yeah, uh, you know, tarbiya is not something easy and is not something that can be done quickly. We need father and mother to help each other if father and mother are on the same page most of the time children also will follow them but if they are disagreeing if they are you know arguing all the time quarreling they give different signals to children they use uh, children against each other this will damage children so if you have a husband or wife that is well uh, understanding and committed, mashallah, alhamdulillah. If not, this doesn't mean you cannot uh, still try to create peace and harmony in the family. You can do, it's more difficult, inshallah, you have great reward. This is your jihad, this is your struggle for the sake of Allah. But even if you can involve your husband or wife 20 percent 30 percent is better than nothing and it's better than fighting over it in different cases uh, that parents for example if they are harsh enough yeah their kids their kids are mostly you know uh, scattered in their way they're not uh, good in uh, their success as well as in life and what what is uh, our Tahiri uh, readings about this? And second, about the media, media invasion is uh, definitely too much in uh, in our society, in all the societies, particularly in uh, cartoons or every every you know, mother and father, you know, they just uh, they allow them to watch cartoons, which is contrary to our traditions traditional life as well so uh, this is also you know they are encouraging to uh, different languages as well as to different norms so we are not in control of them uh, kindly direct us what can we do 
to avoid because because in in Japan what we have seen in schools, tabiat is very good. They are they don't allow kids to have uh, tablets or maybe uh, like uh, cartoons or they're just like Islamic uh, tabia. But in actually after they coming home and they're at home or they're with friends, the kids are with friends, uh, we have less control over them. Uh, although we are teaching them, but the society has overall too much uh, influence over them. So uh, we don't know how to control them, how to control them and how to direct them Islamically. So kindly direct us. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> Regarding Ayatollah Mutahari's view, of course, uh, he has discussed this issue in different parts of the book. So, inshallah, if you uh, follow these uh, lectures from the beginning to the end, then you can develop a comprehensive view about his idea. Although, this is only one of his books, uh, and in the book Insan Kamil also we had many things that can be foundation for this tarbiya. Uh, parents have great role, but as I said, this is a challenging time because in the past, 90% of the job was done by parents. And you could also, for example, you know, choose uh, what type of uh, school they want to go, what type of, I don't know, teacher would teach them at home, etc. Uh, society was in harmony with family, with community. But now, sometimes we live in a society which is totally different from our community, from our faith, you know, values. And sometimes there is only one uh, school, for example, available. Of course, you can do homeschooling, but sometimes parents are not trained for that or are not capable. Anyway, uh, it's a challenging time, although it has also its positive aspects as well, because today for people who are understanding, who are wise, who can discern, it's good that we have lots of things available. But for children who are not experienced, who are not wise in their selections, it's a challenging time. So parents need to very much educate themselves about parenting, about tarbiyah. Uh, so you can, for example, when your child becomes ill, you can take them to doctor. But many times for their tarmia, you are the only one who should help them. So you have to learn something like, you know, if there is no doctor, you have to become a little nurse at least, you know, to help your family. Now, for a spiritual thing, religious things, you need to be somehow uh, educator of your family. So. Islamic education is now very uh, much needed, more than any time in the past, about especially parenting, about tarbiya. And you should not take things as trial and error basis. Uh, you, very, you mentioned very good example, for example, about you know using tablets or smartphones. We should not let these things be used by our children just as soon as they become available or we can afford to buy them for our children or because most of children have them at this age we have to give them at this age we should see what's the best time for them to have these things but we should have prepared them already so that when we don't give them this they don't think you know we are depriving them and they are losing something, you know, great. So we need to be in control of everything that we do for our children, not to be driven by fashion, by media, by films, by cartoons, by um, children books that a school may give them. We need to be in control of everything as much as possible. And of course, if there are like-minded families, parents, and they can make their children play with each other super in a supervised way, discuss with other, so that their relations are again supervised by you and with, are with reliable people, 
that would be great help. So our main assets in this age are family and community. If we do well in family and community, then for when they go to the larger society, they can shine, inshallah. And even secular society would appreciate children that are well trained, properly brought up. They don't appreciate it when we are doing it, <laughs> unfortunately. But later, when they go to work, when they undertake responsibilities, when they observe rights of other people, when they are very productive, then they would appreciate. They would see that, oh, these people who have family, a, st a strong family you know, ties, a strong family upbringing, they are much better than people that family left them to the society and to the schooling and etc. Thank you so much. Uh, May Allah bless you. Sir. Very a comprehensive answer. And, uh, indeed, it is. Uh, um, it is a fact that media has uh, highly high influence for the children, yeah. and parents has have to uh, cope with that. So, thank you so much. May Allah bless you, Shalla. Jazakum Allah khairan. Jee, assalamualaikum. Alaykum assalam. Uh, yeah, uh, the same question uh, with the uh, for the parents and kids. Like, uh, can you uh, please mention your city first? Yeah, I, I'm uh, like uh, I'm from Dubai. Yes. The smell. Uh, um, yeah, uh, like you know, my uh, even the same because we don't have knowledge, so we cannot uh, do properly tarbiya of kids. So like uh, I find uh, in YouTube uh, many scholars. But um, like you know, they they teach like uh, these are the problems, but they don't give us uh, solution. But I find uh, one uh, lady a scholar. She is a pediatrician and uh, she is a uh, like for uh, she is a doctor, Kanwal Kesar from Pakistan. So I find her lecture like you know she uh, she just teaches this is the issue and how to do. Mm -hmm. So is it okay if I go because she is a Sunni scholar? Yeah, if it is not going to affect your aqidah, there's no problem. You know, Rasulullah said, ot, ot, ot ilm walo Seek knowledge even if it requires to travel to China. Uh, so, okay. so we, our only concern is if someone is going to affect your aqidah, your akhlaq. Uh, but if it's a practicing Muslim who is not targeting directly or indirectly your aqidah, it shouldn't be a problem. Bless you, Michelle. Okay, thank you, thank you. Jazakumullah khair. Ahsan. Yes, Salam alaikum. Wa there is a question in the uh, chat. Uh, the question is, is it okay to lie in front of child to say positive things about father? 
This is uh, not a lie. This, I said, if father has you know positive things, mention to children. And I don't think anyone is free from positive things. Even a very bad person certainly has positive things. But if needed, in order to reconcile between father and child, between two brothers, two sisters, etc., if needed, ulama say, for islah dat al bain, telling a lie is permitted. If needed, there is nothing good you can find, and you have to tell a lie so that child doesn't hate his father or father doesn't hate the child. Husband and wife are going through difficult time, and the only way to save their marriage is to tell a lie. Normally, ulama say, Eslahu dhatul bain is one of the exceptions for which telling a lie is permitted. You try other ways, you try not to tell a lie, you try to, for example, say things, uh, you know, we say toria, sometimes something has two meanings. It can be understood in a different way, and uh, that's not a lie, that's, you know, saying something that can be understood two ways. But if nothing works and you have to tell a lie to save a marriage, you can do it. Because saving marriage, saving relation with people, reconciliation is so important that if the only way to do it is telling a lie, is purposeful. You can check your marriage, but I think there is no exception as far as I know. This is very much accepted that Islahu dhat al bain is an exception. But I don't think we need to reach this point many times. We just need to bring to the front positive things which are sometimes hidden by bad things or by negligence, etc. Otherwise, every person has some good th things. May Allah inshallah bless all of you and let us end with du'a of Faraj inshallah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma kulli waliyaka al hujjat ibn al Hassan salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai. في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها طبيلا وامن علينا برضاه وهب لنا رأفته ورحمته ودعاه خيرا اللهم اشف مرضانا اللهم ارحم موتانا اللهم اقض حوائجنا اللهم أد عنا الدين وأغننا من الفقر برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل الله على محمد وآل محمد. يا الله إن شاء الله help you in all your uh, affairs, especially in تربية of your children. And may Allah إن شاء الله help our children to grow and shine إن شاء الله in our life and life of our community and humanity. جزاكم الله خيرا التماس الدعاء.